Welcome to Tech Story Live. I'm your host, Scott Katoon. We're in studio at WGN Radio talking with some of Chicago's top entrepreneurs, founders, and innovators. Joining us right now is the COO of Go Go Air, John Wade. Thank Good you morning. so much. Great to be here. Uh, so this is funny. I, I wasn't going to start with this, but since I was having technical troubles this morning, uh, I just got the Verizon MiFi. Okay. And uh, obviously no relation to air, but uh, I'm just fascinated about how all of this has like grown so rapidly. Sure. It wasn't that long ago that was you'd sit there with your phone and you know be like, this was everything. And then it was like, oh, I have a computer. That's like iPad. Then I've got to have the data plan. And now you have mobile hotspots. And now your phone becomes a hotspot. And then all the way back, way before even that, was Air Hotspots. How did you guys, I mean, tell me more about GoGo -Go Air. Sure. Now, the company's been around about 25 years, so we're a 25-year-old startup, if you will. Um, originally doing things like voice communications to airplanes, because there wasn't enough spectrum to kind of do anything more than just voice. And then way back in 2006, the FCC basically said, that voice service we have on airplanes today, nobody's using it anymore, so let's see if we can repurpose that spectrum for something else. And... What can you do with it? And GoGo, -Go, amongst other companies, said, we could do broadband with that. So uh, that's the uh, FCC said, great, let's go and auction that. And GoGo -Go was fortunate enough to be awarded the spectrum. And from that, in-flight Wi-Fi emerged. And so that's the story of GoGo. -Go. When you get, so with the, the awarding of the spectrum, is that something where there were multiple bidders? Or was it something where, because I, I was just talking to one of the guys over at Verizon about, and I don't mean a local Verizon store, I mean like Verizon right. corporate, about how they got out to such a quick run in the MiFi space. They bought up all this broadband all over the country, and, and that's why they're able to tell everyone we have the most fastest internet, whatever. Um, how did, I don't know if you know this or can talk about it, but how did you guys line up? Was it just first first mover? Like how oh, was no. It's, it, it's, to get the spectrum, it's, it's an auction. So you're out there bidding against other guys and so raising tons of capitals how you get oh that. yeah yeah so we had to go raise a bunch of money and then spend i think 31 million i think it was we actually spent with, with the fcc to get the license rights and then you got to go design the technology and put the network in place so we've got about 450 cell sites if you will across the country that kind of deliver the um the uh, legacy uh, gogo service we'll talk about which is more cellular based yep um, so we built that around 2007, 2008. So a lot of people have used that on American and Delta and other airlines. And now we've upped the ante yet again um, in that we've gone from the sort of 3G technology into a next generation technology using satellite. And as recently as last week, we actually announced the fastest ever internet connection off an airplane anywhere. And the market responded with a resounding surge. It liked it. It certainly liked it. We went over 100 megabits per second. And that's the first time that there's ever been that kind of speed off an airplane. How does that, so what is the difference? I mean, ultimately, I, mean, if, I think people think that it's the same. Maybe it is. But what is the difference between when I have my phone data plan that I'm using here and me being able to do it in the air? Sure. Um, you can think of us like a telephony company putting um, a, a telephony infrastructure onto an airplane. It used to be that it was, uh, we call it an air-to-ground product, so it was very much like a cellular system. Now it's satellite-based, so we're the same sort of way that your phone connects to a cellular provider, or if you have one of those satellite phones that connects yep. to a satellite. It's exactly the same thing. You're connecting to a satellite, and then we put Wi-Fi hotspots on the aircraft. We put like five or six of them on, something like that, so there's enough bandwidth to be able to really use the, the link effectively. And then you just connect in, and um, whether you're paying for the service or whether it's um, increasingly likely to go free, you have the ability to connect and get close to a broadband at home experience and certainly a mobile broadband experience. That's really what 2KU does today. It gives you a true mobile broadband experience. So what I think is really interesting about what you guys are doing as a company, just as a whole, I had not long ago, I had uh, the head of talent for cars.com here. And I look at you guys, obviously very different businesses, but I look at you guys similarly because you are, in my opinion, the original tech companies of Chicago. Well, They're the original, the, you know, the original big the big ones, and, and there's been lots of reinvention. There's been lots of changes in the market. It's 25 years. Technology has changed insanely. And airplanes, even though you still fly 20-year-old planes, the tech inside of them changes. The, you know What you can and cannot do changes. Uh, terrorist attacks and security obviously had a big role in, in things changing. Um, I, I guess the, the question that I asked those at Cars.com I want to ask you is, how have you guys stayed sort of like a big startup, which I still think you guys are. How, how have you stayed nimble enough to, particularly in aviation, to be able to make adjustments on the fly and to continue to be five, six years ahead of the roadmap so that you guys have a big surge not long ago, which is awesome. Sure. There's a great quote from uh, Tom Peters, if you know anything about management consulting. One of his quotes is, 
if you don't like irrelevance, you're going to, sorry, let me get that wrong. If you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevancy a hell of a lot less. You yeah. have to be able to change. You have to be able to innovate. And one of the things that GoGo has managed to do as we've kind of grown from this small startup to this $600 million and growing company today is by innovating, is by constantly looking at what you do, how can you do, be do it better, and not being afraid to throw out what you did in the past and, and bring in something new. How do you do that? How does that manifest itself internally? So we as customers get to see that, you know, the fact that we now can actually, you know, more, if I remember reading in the piece you're talking about, the announcement you're talking about, more people on the plane can use it and use mm -hmm. it faster and better. Um, how do you guys do that internally? How does the company, how is the company growth internally changed? Do they work in teams, innovation teams? Like how, how do you structure it compared to say your normal, you know, big behemoth company? Sure. It's kind of, it's kind of a fascinating balancing act because what you've got to be able to do is you scale the company, you've got to kind of operationalize. And with operationalizing a company, you can actually kill the innovation, which actually makes you something novel and unique in the first place. Yep. As COO, which happens all the time. It does, yeah. As COO, I've got the responsibility for operationalizing it. Now I happen to be a nerd myself, and I've got a tech background. Um, we've got an amazing team in our CTO team, and uh, we um, constantly innovate around uh, wireless technologies, so we're always kind of pushing the leading edge. And I think beyond that, in terms of just having the, the great tech talent we've got, it's about the culture that you bring into the company. And right from the CEO down, one of our core mantras is to constantly innovate, constantly challenge the status quo and say, how can you do this different? How can you do it better? So it really is just pervasive throughout the entire company, this willingness to kind of not only improve, but where necessary, tear things up and do it completely differently. Would you say that that was something that was intentional from the very beginning, that the, the growth was like that? Or was, was there ever a moment when you guys looked at it and were like, you know, this, if we're going to scale, we're going to have to make some serious changes or, or things are not going well and you had to make changes? How, how was it intentional? Right from the get-go, you guys knew this is how we're going to do it. There was a plan and we followed the roadmap or... No, I mean, I wish nothing the, ever goes. I, that yeah, way. nothing ever goes that right. It's like you know the uh, the Mike Tyson quote: "As soon as you get punched in the face, uh, yeah, you know, the, the first the plan yeah. changes as soon as you get punched in the face the yep. first time." So same kind of thing uh, along the way for GoGo. -Go. There's always been challenges along the way, and it's that kind of that balance in terms of making sure that you can scale. And we do it in the aviation industry, right? Which is um, a highly regulated industry, which because it has to be because airplanes don't fall out of the sky, which is a good thing. Certainly, especially is. as I'm about to go and get on one of those airplanes. Yeah. Um, so we're constantly looking at how we do things safely with a very high level of uh, safety and all the oversight from the regulatory authorities, but at the same time not losing that core of what it is that makes you different. How do you innovate? How do you constantly stay in ahead of the, thing, the changes that are happening? We spend a lot of time talking to people in the market. We spend a lot of time talking to um, entrepreneurs and technical innovators who are constantly looking to just push the envelope a little bit, a little bit further. One of the things that I think most entrepreneurs or most founders are probably wondering but also maybe struggling with is you've got to know your customer base and sometimes you know your customer we, we talked about this with uh with another guest customer base and the and the user might not be the same person the person who's going to utilize your your services is not necessarily the person who's buying and meaning they're not buying direct from you they're buying it from united or delta whoever mm -hmm. and you're selling to them you have to stay ahead of the value proposition game that United is offering their customers. How do you build something that you know that your price pricing and, and financial part of this is going to have to fluctuate? It's got to be a little bit nimble, otherwise uh, you, you become obsolete. If, if it's just not something that's valued enough that they can charge right. for it, then you're out of luck. How have you been able to work through that and, and make sure that you maintained a certain amount of value in what you're providing so that the, the airlines would definitely want to make sure Sure. But they didn't they didn't get rid of the service. So I think of our customers as falling into what I call the three P's. The passengers, the pilots, and the plane. You think um, people often think about the internet on board an aircraft is only about, only about passengers, but it's actually increasingly not. It's about how you improve the operational efficiency of the aircraft and the safety of the aircraft. And we're doing that today through things like uh, providing turbulence reports to the to the pilots so they can actually avoid turbulence situations. And several of our airlines are adopting that and other technologies that help the crew in the cockpit fly the aircraft more efficiently. And now we're starting to get to the point in time where we can actually help the Internet of Things I was just gonna say come the IoT to the airplane comes in. itself. There's a fascinating statistic about how much data a Boeing 787 generates each flight. Oh, I, I can only imagine. Half a terabyte of data each flight. 
And people want that data because there are hundreds and hundreds of computer systems on those airplanes today. There's something like 100,000 sensors on a Boeing 777. And they want to know all that data that's going on in the same way that Tesla has completely changed the way in which we think about automotive uh, reporting and the, the innovation that they're bringing into automotive space. Aviation is poised to do that same thing. So GoGo -Go is right at the epicenter of what's going on in terms of connecting the passengers, the pilots, and the plane. And that's one of the reasons we're so excited about our future is that we're going to be right at that point of irrevocably changing aviation. And I don't think there's many opportunities one gets in one's life to, to know that you are at the point of being able to irrevocably change an entire industry. I was just going to ask if you're able to read the screen over my shoulder because right below the last question I, I had run down here is where do you see the change of history going and where do you see things going in the future? And I, I was going to enter the conversation if you if you were not a great guest, which you are obviously a great guest. If you weren't, I was going to say, hey, like, keep feeding you things. <laughs> IoT was the one that I was going to lead with because it's no-brainer to me that aviation, my, my father flew forever, uh, meeting lots of pilots. It's not the fastest tech savviest thing which is funny because the you know the plane is full of gadgets and it's like the biggest piece of technology we have but yet a lot of pilots and people in aviation don't seem to be really you know tech savvy so to speak uh i think that iot is going to change that just by a ton because you're giving so much information to people yep. who are just na naturally generally pilots and things tend to be naturally very curious and the idea that i can give you all this stuff to learn more about your flying, to learn more about the efficiency, to learn more about gas, to learn just everything is going to be absolutely fascinating. Very much. I mean, one of the biggest gripes we all have as passengers is when the airplane is bouncing around the sky or if you get onto the aircraft to, to board it and then suddenly they're, eh, we can't go, there's a problem with the plane. So we've already started to change the first problem in terms of bouncing around the sky by giving the pilots views of weather 200 miles out so they can change for fl flight clearance ahead of hidden turbulence. And in fact, the air traffic controllers are now asking the pilots, how do you know this? We don't even know this ourselves in the ATC centers. The next change in aviation is to go from on condition maintenance, sorry, on schedule maintenance to on condition maintenance. Because today, if we know what the, the condition of that part is on the aircraft, we can start to predict when it's going to fail. So yep. we can actually change that part ahead of it failing, ahead of you being sat on the plane thinking, when are we going to leave? Because the airline will know ahead of time and can preempt that problem on the aircraft and keep those aircraft flying more regularly. As well as, I think, just keeping a better line of communication to the passengers. I think one of the major reasons that you know we all sit in traffic, right? We're all in the car in traffic. That's not... It sucks, but we all know what the problem is. I think that's what leads us to be like, all right, I can rationalize with this. I can do whatever. It's when we travel via flight that no one says anything. We don't know what the hell's going on. So we're sitting there for like two hours on the runway, and we're like, you know, what the hell? I think that with, with all of this, there's a, a better stream of communication. And so you can, again, through the data, you can reach – the passengers and tell them, hey, here's what's going on. Here's the timeline. Here's here's how long it traditionally takes. This is 15 minutes. Is not just my estimated guess. This is literally a line of machines saying that we're you know we're accurately 10 minutes away, five minutes away, four minutes. Away. Update sure. people and they know what they know what to expect. And I think that's going to be a huge game changer, uh, obviously for you guys. But it's a game changer for the airlines themselves to make the the ones that use the tools that you provide uh, a better overall experience, and therefore more passengers want to fly with them. One of the biggest stresses for people on a plane today is, did my bag make it? Yeah. And with an app on your phone and being able to connect right into the aircraft, the airline's back office systems, they're going to be able to tell you that your bag is on the plane. So there's so many ways in which oh, we can yeah. take the technology today and make that travel experience more um, comfortable for you, more reassuring for you. Um, we're really just at the forefront of how... Well, I know where my tax rebate's going, I can tell you that. I, <laughs> I know where I'm putting that money in there. Uh, this has been incredibly fascinating, John. Thank you so much for taking the time. Where do people go to learn more about GoGo? Uh, they can go to gogoair.com, um, which is a great portal for people to kind of learn more about what the company does. Uh, we've got some new web presence we're going to be revealing that talks about more about our 2KU technology and all the great uh, things that 2KU is going to be doing. Very cool. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Very cool. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Very cool. Thank